at least. So welcome everybody here to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschko and I'm in charge here of the Siegel Center. We bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And uh, of course, um, are devoted to the research and the scholarship um, of theater. And it's an incredible honor for us tonight to have again, Richard Schechner here with us. Tonight, we have done many events here, significant ones. We did a big event for your 80th birthday from nine o'clock in the morning till nine in the evening. And, and I survived. And you survived. And um, But the reason uh, we are here is not to celebrate Richard's birthday, which is coming up 10 years later after his 80th, which is an incredible achievement. He's one of the smartest people I have ever met, one of the most influential people I have ever met, one of the, the, the founders of our field, an interrupter in the field, someone who is really thinking. It always reminds me what Heiner Müller said. Heiner Müller said, and I knew him, he said, using Brecht without criticizing him is treason. <laughs> and Richard, what he did when he started his theater work, you know, he rethought everything. He took uh, everything out, discard, I think it was uh, one of his ideas, if you have a bag, bag of bad apples, the only thing what you can do is you have to throw them all out and you only put the good ones in and add others. And I think this is what Richard did, his uh, influence is enormous, we all know that. But why we are here tonight is uh, to uh, celebrate uh, one of his many facets uh, in his work, the Raja boxes, the rather acting theory, the acting practice. And um, with us today are Rachel, Paula, Michelle, and Nisha. And um, so we are celebrating a book um, you guys have worked seven years on. Naraza has nine boxes and it took seven years to think about it, which is uh, connected because it's a complex thing, a simple thing, but also very complex. And we're going to hear about it. Do we have the book? Can we show it, hold it up um, to our audience also? It's a fantastic, I think, uh, a, a work. It really has the theoretical background, but also a practical one. It combines what in Germany we say, angewandte Theaterwissenschaft, like applied theater science, as Brecht would say. So you have a theoretical background, but you also see how to do it. So it's a great honor to have you all here with us. And we would like to welcome our viewers on HowlRound. And I would like to thank Vijay and Emily, everybody and Teresa up there in the box. HowlRound has been our partner for over 15 years now. We were one of the very first to live stream before it became um, um, the new norm. So it's a great thing to have everybody with us. And I know, to, especially tonight, we have audiences from all around the world. And um, so welcome everybody here. So um, first of all, thank you. And let's ask Richard first, how are you today? <laughs> Terrible. I've never felt worse. You have to take the mic so we can hear you. Uh, yeah, but, but you have to turn it down so you don't get uh, feedback. Everybody's yeah. got to turn off yeah. the microphone. And then when we speak, you can turn it on. OK. So I, I, I feel great, yeah. And I saw the uh, works at the end of the workshop uh, today, and it was really spectacular in this space. Uh, about 22, 23 people, most of them women, doing very, very good work. Uh, but I think that tonight we should concentrate on my colleagues here who have put together this spectacular book. I'm in the book, and I'm very proud to be in the book, but the book is their book. It's edited by Rachel and Paula and Michelle. And so that's what should be our subject. So I don't know where you want to begin. Yeah, maybe we start everybody a few words, you know, say who you are, what your context is of work. And Michelle, maybe we start with you. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Michelle Minnick. I live in Baltimore currently, and um, I'm not sure what to share. Let's see. Um, I started working with Richard first in his theater company, East Coast Artist, many years ago, and then started doing the workshop work, and then decided to go on and do a PhD in performance studies. So um, have many connections to Richard's thinking. And um, I'm these days, I use the work in um, working with very young humans, third, second and third graders are my main <laughs> The main group that I'm working with, um, I've taught it in university uh, situations as well and used it for directing and devising. 
um, and I'm also applying it now in therapeutic contexts as I'm completing um, training as a dynamic embodiment somatic movement practitioner. And um, yeah, I, I work with uh, at the intersections of performance, somatic practice, climate change, and environmental justice in Baltimore. Hi, everybody. I'm Nisha Sachnani, and I direct the program in drama therapy at NYU. And I came to this work, one, because Richard has had a significant influence on our field as well in drama therapy. And I've been using Raza boxes in the training of drama therapists and the training of other mental health practitioners. Outside of that role, I co-direct a lab called the Jamil Arts and Health Lab, which was established with the World Health Organization to link the arts and health. I'm very excited to bring some of this work forward there as well. Hi, I'm Rachel Bowditch. Um, I'm a professor of theater in the School of Music, Dance, and Theater at Arizona State University, the Herberger Institute. Um, I first encountered Richard and the work in 2003. I was an, a master's student in performance studies. Paula and Michelle and Paula were my teachers, and Richard came in, and I remember my first experience of the work was transformational. I had done the Lecoq training, I'd done viewpoints, Suzuki training, and as soon as I did the Rasa Boxes work, there was some floodgate that opened, and was so freeing and I remember going to Richard the first time I met him and said I want to learn everything about this work and he said stick around and I'm like okay um, and then I ended up going on to do my PhD you were my dissertation director uh, I, I did a lot of the apprentice work this work really comes through an apprentice model uh, and then I've been teaching at Arizona State for the last uh, 18 years hired by Linda Essig right there in the front row um, and I've been teaching Rasa Boxes in undergraduate and graduate training, um, semester-long uh, modules. And I'm a theater director, and it's informed all of my directing work significantly. I can't imagine ever directing anything without using Rasa Boxes and this training as a foundational pedagogy. Hello. <coughs> I'm Paula Marie Cole. I first worked with Richard in person in the 90s. Gosh, what was the first show? I came into Three Sisters. I think I was the third Natasha. The third Natasha when we went and did the equity run at the Annex. But, um, and I may have told you this, I actually worked with Richard Chetkin's books when I was an undergrad, having a dearth of kind of information about how workshops might work. We kind of read Schechner and Grotowski and all of this and put together our own material in the very same undergrad where I teach now, which is Ithaca College. Then I went on to work with you in Hamlet and I did the workshop and also uh, like Rachel, I wanted to know everything about the Rasa Boxes after I learned it. Um, I teach now undergrads. We just finished our 21st annual Rasa Boxes workshop for first years, which Melanie did when she was a student at Ithaca College. And um, wow, it's exciting. And we're really looking forward to what's coming next, which is teacher training and making this work more available to the folks that want to learn it. Yeah. Go ahead, Linda, so that you can. So, I, because I, I'm aware that there are people here and there are people out in the, uh, uh, you know, how round land, you might not know what Rasa Boxes is. So I think we should, uh, uh, I should say a few words. Um, it's a method of uh, e emotional theatrical performative training uh, based on, at one level, on the uh, eight rasas outlined by the Indian uh, Sanskrit's uh, putative founder, uh, theorist of uh, performance, Bharata. He's probably not a single person, but he wrote a Natya Shastra. Shastra is a kind of holy book, sacred book, but it's also pra practical. And Natya means theater, dance, music, and there are elements of all that in his book. And in one chapter of the book, chapter six, the book was written around r roughly 2,000 years ago, and one or compiled at that time. In one chapter, he describes rasa, R-A-S-A -S -A in, in uh, English, uh, Western uh, alphabet, and it, rasa really means flavor, taste. It, it's something that is uh, permeates, that is close, and he says that performance, uh, theater and dance and music are, are transmit rasa. So you, in my view, uh, taking from him, 
you, uh, if, if uh, Western theater people are audiences for the ear or spectators for the eye, a Rasik uh, 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 people are partakers as you partake in a banquet, as you partake in something that is uh, intimate and close. So although you can, and obviously you, you do perform using the eye and the ear, you use the eye and the ear as a way into the nose, the mouth, uh, the, uh, the throat, you know, the, the more visceral. And there, these eight rasas are eight basic emotions. I won't go over them here because we don't have that much time. And then in the 10th century AD, a, a, a Kashmiri uh, scholar, Abhinabe Gupta, added a ninth rasa, uh, Shanta, which is a kind of uh, uh, compilation or culmination for all the rest. He was a Buddhist. And he, he uh, Abhinava Gupta wanted to find uh, a Buddhahood or, or enlightenment. And Shanta was a, a feeling of enlightenment if you could get all the other eight rasas in balance with each other. Now, the book, Inside the Performance Workshop, is about rasa boxes, but it's about a workshop technique which I devised at first, but all of these people have uh, advanced in great uh, 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 creativity, uh, so that rasa boxes is not something that stands alone. I mean, uh, somewhat like uh, Stanislavski's method of physical actions, you can't just come to it. You have to have a preparation to it or see David Zinder out there, Michael Chekhov's uh, uh, emotional affect. You can't just come to it. You have to move to it. So the workshop is a series of exercises that leads to and culminates in rasa boxes. Then paradoxically, once you get to rasa boxes, you can go back to the very early exercises and rasa box them. So there, it's, it's so it, it is something that swallows its own tail or that goes in a widening gyre, uh, and it's a very powerful exercise. And I was affected not only by Bharata's Natya Shastra, but by Arto's uh, uh, comment in his Theater of Cruelty that the actor is a, quote, athlete of the emotions. That fascinated me. What did that mean, an athlete of the emotions? So I was I looked at athletics, and I found that ath uh, athletes are able to uh, uh, be in their action entirely. Then a whistle blows or something, and they're out of their action entirely. Then the whistle blows again, and they're back in it. So I, when I was trained in theater, you had to take 30 minutes or even longer, you know, a long time to prepare. You, you slowly got into character. But these, these great athletes were, quote, in character, then out of character, then in character. And I felt that performers, uh, aesthetic performers, uh, dancers, actors, musicians, you know, particularly uh, actors, performers, could also be out of it and then in it instantly. And, and it's, it's that practice uh, which is of athletes of the emotion. There's a lot more to it, but that's some of the basis of it. And it's very, very beautifully outlined, described, theorized in the book, which has several uh, sections, a theoretical and historical section, an account of particular uh, practices, uh, and an application section. So it's, the book is very well balanced. And I really commend and thank and uh, mm -hmm. my uh, colleagues here for doing this book. It was a long labor, but it was well worth it. Yeah, this is the, the thank you for the for the introduction, um, Richard. You were interested in finding new ways of actors training. You were, your curiosity also led to it. Rachel. Um, tell us a little bit of this workshop this afternoon. We still have some. I don't know if the audiences can see them. Some fields, some tapes here left. Tell us a little bit what happens in the workshop of Raza. What is it? All right. Well, today was an introductory workshop, so it was only three hours. We didn't. We just gave people a taste of what the work was about. Um, and you mentioned that when you came into the room, the atmosphere had completely changed. And so that starts from the very first moment we meet the participants, which happens out in the lobby. And when they first come into the space, if you notice, there's a first blue line there. Um, and that the participants come to the line, and they have to have a moment of pausing, of checking in. That's called the crossing line. And this idea of crossing into this space of working of, of um, creativity is really help set that frame. Um, 
and then we did some breathing, some introductions. Um, you led us through a, a movement workshop, uh, I mean, a movement warm up. Then we did an orange exercise where we sniffed the orange and we had the sensation of the orange. And then we introduced the rasas. So it, all of the rasas are in Sanskrit. Uh, you could have done them in English. Maybe let's do, so you have nine fields and they represent states? Nine different rasic emotion. emotions. Oh. Um, Tell us in English names. In oh, both. So you have vira, which is courage or strength, and you can jump in. If, um, adbuta, wonder, awe, surprise. Um, I don't know what that, bionica, fear. Um, Shringara, love. Karuna, sadness, vipatsa, disgust. Raudra, anger and hasya is laughter. There's lots to say about each emotion, and Paul Ekman, who was a huge influence on this work as well, um, it'd be parts of, I mean, Adbuta might be the shortest of emotion where Karuna might be the longest. Um, so, and there's, so, there's lots of different associations. Um, it's and very, very, very complex. Yeah. It's, it's Do you need uh, the microphone? Um, yeah. Very complex. It ought not to be reduced to these words, but yeah. you start with these words. Uh, there's a little irony I can't resist. Paul Ekman and I know each other very well, and it turned out we were lived in the same house as children. Uh, uh, he first and me immediately after his parents. His father sold his house to my father. Um, we didn't know this until we had been working together for a while. So what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. So and the idea is then in the very simple ones for all the audience members who haven't been here, you, ha you are in those boxes and you jump or you go into the boxes and you connect to the energy, to and the- Today, all we got to was breath and shape. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we start. And But there's many, many layers all the way to doing monologues to the boxes, scene work. Again, it's not a style. You can take any style, Shakespeare, uh, clowning, modern dance. modern dance. You could take opera, you could take anything through it. It's sort of a lens through which you can take many different styles. Um, and then you can get into I intensities, relating, working with objects. I mean, there's over 100 exercises related to that. Today, we just got through breath and movement. Mm -hmm. That was all. A, a typical workshop normally is like three weeks at least, uh, you, and, then, and then multiple of them. Um, I just want to add that we're looking at this particular configuration of tape on the floor, but the entire workshop is like us constantly rearranging what the floor looks like. And the principle, the sort of core principle of the entire workshop that we've talked about and wrote about in the book is crossing the line in general. So you're being asked to cross lines for all kinds of reasons, to do all kinds of different things on the other side of those lines, or to choose not to cross the line, and then to examine why you're deciding not to cross the line. So I want to just broaden out and not get hyper-focused on what we did today, just because this only exists because of all the other lines that are crossed on the way to getting to this in the larger three-week workshop. So whereas in the Rasa boxes, it's about crossing a line to enter a particular and, and physicalize a particular emotional state. In another exercise, it might be crossing a line on the other side of which you have to move in super slow motion and you're in a character and you're meeting another character who's also moving in super slow motion. Or it might be um, you're crossing a line to step to a microphone and tell a dream that you had or right so there's it's a whole world in which this is like one of the playing fields and as Richard was talking about it kind of looping back and swallowing its own tail this then informs those those other things as well so just just to sort of like broaden the frame slightly before we dig in deeper to Russell boxes specifically. Well, I was listening to you and thinking about the lines that health providers are asked to navigate. Um, you know, there's there's a couple things we know about psychotherapeutic practice. One is that it relies on a solid therapeutic relationship or a constant negotiation of coming into a relationship with someone where there's a sense of attunement, a sense of um, empathic connection, like you're working together in a kind of empathic solidarity towards a shared worldview. And if that's not there, it tends not to be all that helpful. Um, the things that get in the way of a therapeutic alliance are when you don't like the person you're sitting in front of, they're on the other side of the line. I mean, this it works. therapy works beautifully when you like the person you're working with. <laughs> the challenge is when you're sort of put off by the coping strategies or ways of being, and you know, you either work together at the edge of 
of the, of the line between you to find a way through or you don't. And the other thing that presents a challenge is the fact that often health providers are working in systems that work against the very motivation that they have to work towards care in the first place. So they may be motivated around an empathic attunement or around care, but they're working within systems that for one reason or another are disrupting that possibility, whether it's a limitation on sessions or it's a lack of, you know, it's money, it's money, it's money, it's money, it's money. <laughs> Um, it's it's these other systemic and structural um, lines that get in the way. Uh, and so that presents, um, uh, you know, a, a few options. And one of them is to suppress that reality, that dissonance, and to do the work anyway. So it's a kind of an emotional suppression there. And I'm just going to move through it and figure my best way to, uh, you know, the best way to, to, to navigate this. Uh, or one really aligns with those institutional goals and values and creates an even further cavity, a, a, a dissonance, with what they were initially there to do in the first place. So recognizing those challenges, I've been integrating, when I can, Raza boxes in the training of therapists, specifically drama therapists, because it, it helps them with those two challenges, to notice the disgust that arises within them, the, 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 the range of experiences and flavors that they are constantly tasting in this work, and that they encounter in another, to find some space of um, encounter you know, in, in, as we progress deeper into it. Yeah, that's a little bit for now mm -hmm. therapy. Um, <clears throat> um, the Ratha practice and theory somehow seems to be condensed and all your interests, if you look at the Grotowski Indian Theater and Arto Turner um, and everybody, Goffman, who you, you mentioned. Um, and it has something very radical in it, um, if I understand right. In the book you say, in your article, Everything you have learned now here in the workshop is yours. Take it, make it better. So the idea um, is that someone who is searching for new ways to do theater, to yeah, find new ways of training actors, to see plays you have never seen before, this is Richard's idea how an actor could train, what might make him a better performer. And, um, and it's an interesting, I think, one of the most interesting um, ideas of how to train an actor. So um, the question to you three, um, what did you make better? What, um, what, why did you make the book? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, I think I found myself getting better. Richard was the first person to say to me as a director, I worked with him as a director, but also within the context of work, the workshop, here's a challenge, here's an invitation to, to do the work, but you know what, if you don't want to, you don't have to. It's really up to you. And somehow the ability to be invited to say yes or to say no as an actor, which is, you know, I grew up in a time where you just do whatever you're sort of told as a trained actor, that's, that's the job. But this in, invited me to show up and to make choices with that. So that's one thing. And I think I got better because of the work that I did with Richard and with Rasa Boxes and TPW. Um, and finding that and many years of studying it and teaching it, I wanted to be able to offer that more comprehensively. It's, it's hard to get to a workshop. And at one time, it, it was the only place where you could take it was NYU if you were a performance studies student. So we wanted to broaden the audience offer our ideas about how the work might be taught and um, hopefully bring in some more people into the work, those that have been teaching like I did when I was an undergrad from a book chapter and inventing exercises, but to, to join us with this exploration which has many years to grow and unfold. So that's one thing. Um, well, I'll, I forgot to mention that I was also an actor in Yo Costas, directed by Schechner. Um, and we use Rasa boxes to develop those characters and that roles, and it was so transformational for me as an actor. I'm now more of a director. Um, but for me, I've, over the last 20 years, after encountering this work, um, for me, it's about emotional intelligence. So there's, three ty there's several diff different types of intelligence, IQ, EQ, and SQ, social intelligence, emotional intelligence, and just intelligence. And for me, this work is what I, how I've grown as a human doing this work is I have become, I believe, more emotionally intelligent and more in touch with my own emotional states and knowing that I can, I can observe when I'm in, a, in the grips of an emotion, as Paul Ekman says, when I'm in that state of Raudra or Karuna and be like, 
oh, wow, I am really in that emotional place, and then later almost analyze what had happened. And I think that this work, as, as I've been teaching it for the last 20 years, it helps develop the emotional intelligence of actors. You hear the statement, you can't work on emotion because it will render it false. But unless you understand the spectrum of the emotions and, eat, and how complex they are, how can you, how can you um, do it safely? So for me, it's about actor safety, that you can come into a very deep emotional place and you can jump out. These ideas of crossing the boundaries have become very important. If you are someone with bipolar or you have someone who is struggling with emotional imbalance and then you're asked to play a role that takes you really deep into a place, how do you come out of that and into that safely? And I feel like Roster Boxes is, serves that purpose. Uh, maybe an actor has never been all the way to the depths of Karuna, which is sadness, or the depths of Raudra, a younger actor in particular. But in this space, they can go there, but then they can go up and they can jump out. And we're not asking them to delve into their emotional traumatic space. We're not asking them to unearth anything that happened. It may come up, but we're not starting with m sense memory. We're not going into memory. Um, and that for me is the most valuable tool. And then we decided we want, about 10 years ago, we wanted to write a book about it. So I want to say one, one thing about what you just said. So that a lot of, of the standard performer training, Stanislavski based, is about emotional recall or you try to put yourself in the quote given circumstances of uh, let's say a, a sad event and that will bring the event back and then you can you weep and then you can make an association with it and you can uh, kind of graft that onto a role and so on and so forth. It's a very well known and powerful technique. Rasa boxes works uh, physically first. You're not asked to remember anything. You're asked to do something. And the, the doing is almost starts with a cliche. That's the thing. It starts, you're not asked to be subtle or anything. So, uh, Hasyam. <laughs> and then you stop laughing. So it's, and the laughter, it doesn't have to be sincere. <laughs> it's not about sincerity. It's about able to replicate the physical thing that you're then going to build a bridge back towards whatever, quote, authentic, legitimate experience you have. But it's about expression. Like if you ask of a basketball player, the idea is put the ball in the net, not how you wanted to be a player when you were a kid. After that, you can go back. So, you know, it's, it's that kind of uh, training. And in a safe space, so that you can do it without limit, without uh, judgment of the other or, or of yourself. And the only way you can do it without limit and without judgment is to be able to yes it or no it. In other words, to do it or to refuse to do it. So I don't want to, I'm going to talk about this to the workshop this afternoon, but you have to, as a, as a teacher of it, and it's in the book, it's in this book, you have to give the performer the opportunity to non-participate as well as participate. So, so much of education is about do this, do this, do this. Especially now we're in the age of metrics, right? You have to score, if we're going to go into STEM, you have to reach this level, you have to get a certain ESL test. It's all about achievement and accomplishment. Rasa boxes is not about that. It's about getting rid of that or, or setting that aside. And the paradox is, of course, once you set it aside, you will go further than you ever could have imagined. You're referring to the training of actors, and I think about the training of people and the absence of training uh, in many spaces of being able to make a choice, to step in, to step out, to make a choice at all. And I was thinking of in, when you were um, reflecting a bit, Rachel, around a colleague of mine, Maitri Gopalakrishna in Bangalore, who uses this work with people who've lived through childhood sexual abuse, and their comments have been, I've been, I have a choice when I'm caught in Karuna. I have a choice to step out of it. I have the kinesthetic intelligence to navigate that space more so than before the training. Is this on? No? Okay. Um, so going back to your question, Frank, about how do we make it better? We've definitely made some things different. And part of that is, you know, Richard is 
a man of a certain age, of a certain experience, and when Paula and I started having to figure out what is the pedagogy of this thing together, which is basically how it was elaborated as, a, you know, then it became something that was taking what we learned from Richard, but also it reflected our personalities. And then Rachel, other people came, and so on. So everyone who comes to the work, because it's so personal and so, like, you have to rely a lot on your intuition as a facilitator of this work. And so your interests and your the way you position yourself might be different from person to person. And this is one of the things I'm really excited about when we think about the future of Rasa Boxes is what new things will be brought to the work and illuminated by people who are very different from us who take, who take it on. I mean, most of the teachers so far are white women. And then there are some men and, you know, a few folks of color, but it's, it's you know, we're, we have a certain set of perspectives. Um, the work also shifts in context. So I also direct and devise, as does Rachel, as has Paula, and each context you bring it to makes you shape it in different ways, which is a very interesting way that it grows. And we also each have, I would say one of the things that three of us in particular have brought that is um, enriching the process for people who participate is we're each of us concerned with the process of the actor in a, in a, a kind of level of minutiae and care and you know, that Richard is not necessarily, I don't want to speak for you, Richard, but I'm going to just a little bit, like, you know, you ask because you're, you want to see things from people and you're curious, but it's not always that nitty gritty actor's process that you're interested in. And we as somatic, we're all practitioners of different somatic approaches, so we bring that awareness to it. So I think that's one of the things that's been fed into the work as a process with us coming into it. Um, yeah, just going also back to the therapy part. I mean, how incredible is it to really also have something that you can apply in the real world, a doctor who maybe one minute has to say, you're going to die of cancer in the next three weeks, and then turns to a parent who just had a newborn, their first child, and it took them five years, or whatever. So but how do you be, how to be real in that way, and um, how to, which is, in a way, acting, but also now it's being connected. But you said you were your cast in Richard's production. You said we worked on it. Just tell us how, how the, what did you do? What was how did this look like? How was what was the moment when you worked on it so our audiences can understand? Your cast was a long process. We actually devised it. We started out without a script. You came in with an idea. I the Raza ideas. You said we it was based on Raza. What did you do? Oh, what, oh, were the, I mean, what were the exercises? How did it? help you? What was the method, if you can take I mean, the, the performance workshop was the way that we led those. We had a four-month development process, if I remember correctly. And then at a certain point, you came in to do some specific RASA exercises with us. And so you I put think, the squares out yes. in the rehearsal room? In, at and the you Mama, spoke yeah. the text yeah. of the... And the scenes. But, but the text was coming, and there was a playwright, co-playwright with me, Saviano Sinescu. Mm -hmm. So there... And she had a couple of scenes, and the idea of Yocasta's is Yocasta doesn't hang herself, and what was it? What is her life like at four stages of her life? That's why it's called Yocasta's plural. So there's an eight or nine year old girl. There's the uh, a w a young woman of seventeen or eighteen who has to give Oedipus away. There's the perfect Yocasta who welcomes uh, uh, the ba uh, who welcomes Oedipus back. Has four children. Bing, 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 Bing. At, a, at an age at that time with, you know, very, and then there is the Yocasta of Sophocles' play. And these, they're all on stage together and they interact. But you devise these things, you know, for me, uh, and uh, Michelle is correct, I'm a very practical person. I'll throw my own technique out the window if I don't think it's uh, uh, getting where it's getting. So the idea, uh, the, the, the fundamental thing in my life, both artistic and scholarly, I think, is organicity. In other words, you can't come in predetermined. I don't, I, 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 I've read my Greeks, I know there's such a thing as destiny, but insofar as we're alive, it doesn't occur. As Sartre said, no life is a destiny until after death. Mm -hmm. Then of course it is a destiny. So while we're alive, we either have choice or the illusion of choice, it doesn't matter which. And you shouldn't wrestle with it, but you have to play as if you have choice agency and so on. So that's true not only of 
our individual lives, but I think it's true of the processes we develop. So I've developed this, they've taken it, they've made their own. If somebody else goes on, it'll change again. I'm not like my parents, but I'm not unlike my parents. You know, We are not and not not, to use a Schechnerian expression. We, we are not who we think we are, but we're not not who we think we are, et cetera. So those things are very, very deep in me, this via negativa, this taking away in order to find out, uh, uh, agency in the paradox of denial. And that's all inside of this exercise. So it's not even a workshop. While you were rehearsing, you were losing this, because traditionally, often uh, rehearsal training uh, uh, is completely different. So this is also quite, uh, quite interesting, yeah. Just, I can never tell which is on and which is off. Just because you're asking, you're wanting to get to like the concrete of some of the things that we did. And I remember a, a couple of specific things that we did, um, one of which is something we do often, and one of which Richard and I remember doing together, um, which was, and the work, these workshops that Paula and I taught, which were Rasa Box's intensives, which took place after you all had been working on the show for some time. So they, were, it, they weren't at the beginning. But we did a lot of chorus work. So we did a lot of work where, for example, um, you have a group of people who's moving around the boxes as a chorus. So they have to, they're not necessarily doing the same movements and making the same sounds, but they're, they're working together in each rasa and moving around. And then you have a chore, uh, um, sorry, Portuguese. Um, you have a, the, the chorus leader um, who might lead them or a particular character. It could have been your Costas or someone else who had text. And so that was also a way of working the text, but in relationship to this. Now, a Greek chorus was not something that was in that production, form but this was like a, yeah, to help them find connections to the text because what happens when you work with text in these boxes is that the Rasas teach you all kinds of things about that text you didn't know before you took it in there. The other thing that we did with Richard was we were exploring with Shanta and having someone in Shanta while other people were relating to them. And we did this later in the workshop that you took, Nisha, of having someone be an unmovable God. This was your language, Richard, I think. Having the Shanta person be an unmovable God to whom the people had to relate. Um, and it was very interesting because the Shanta person, the person in that center space could not react, could not respond. They had to just be present for what well, well i remember a specific moment if we're getting specific i i had to deliver in the second version of the play i had to deliver a monologue that ended act one which was by andrea yates the woman who drowned her children in the bathtub it was her verbatim text from her testimony um well okay now you're telling me this um <laughs> Not but, and not not. But 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 we rehearsed. I remember rehearsing it in the Rasa boxes and and sort of all the rage, all the anger, like like kind of the full ninety percent sort of where I went. But the way I ended up doing it, the way we chose to do it, was almost monotone. But all of that rage was internal and was like stuffed down there. But I don't feel like I could have delivered the power of the monologue without having done this exploration to then be able to stuff all those things down. I think it was more effective to actually have um, it be emotionless than have being emotional. So, so that uh, production's online. You can see it. So, a uh, very good film of it. Of course, that's just one instance, one moment. Uh, you know, because it ran for quite some time. And there was Yocasta's and Yocasta's Redux, which was the second version. Uh, and I always, in my not always, but as much as possible, I redo pieces, and it's also about to be published. That that uh, that text, and with a long introduction uh, to it, so that microphone, yeah, yeah. it's on. Yeah, you have to hold it to. Yeah. Oh, I. I <laughs> so at any rate, uh, <laughs> thank you. So I don't have any more to say. About well, it. I just wanted to add. Um, not only can you re rehearse. So I worked on as Ophelia, um, also with Richard and Richard's Hamlet. And so not only did we do, let's say, the closet scene where Ophelia comes to tell Polonius, oh my goodness, uh, Hamlet's crazy, and he just came to me and he socks all down and, and such. So we, you can rehearse it in a single rasa. I'll come in and do the scene all in fear. And let's see what values occur there. Well, now let's do it all in Karuna and see what happens when that scene is all there. Then you can realize, oh, well, it's because there are mixes of things. But then 
On top of that, you can kind of arrange a psychology using Russes, which is what I did. And I asked myself, well, what Russes are allowed to Ophelia by her father? What is she allowed to display, right? And what is she not allowed to display? And when the mad scene comes up, what Russes that were not available to her in society or with her father or with Hamlet come out? What is repressed? What is kept down? And in that discovery process, you realize that I used Raudra, right, mad scene taken literally, and I used Raudra, and, I, and it was down there all the time. And so it kind of, you can arrange a kind of psychology of character using Russes as well if you investigate what's allowed, what's available. So in, in that particular production, I wanted Ophelia to be Paula's actual age. She wasn't 17 when she did it. So the idea was that our conventional Ophelia is a, quote, young, young woman, almost like a girl, right? And a, a kind of a pawn. This Ophelia is in an incestuous relationship with her father, Polonius, who wants to use her, and she's not particularly interested in Hamlet and all. So that's more conventional dramaturgy than within that conventional dramaturgy, which is unorthodox in relationship to Hamlet, uh, who's gay. Uh, so he's interested in Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and Horatio. So uh, that's a whole different. So I bring into it as a director a kind of dramaturgy, but then the emotional life of the of the persona, because I don't even call them characters. I'm not interested in characters in the through line sense of character. I'm interested in Paula Mary Cole in a particular scene doing something that you, the spectator, will see as Ophelia, but I'm only seeing Paula in that particular action. It's not like trying to fictionalize. The fiction is what gets brought to the audience. We don't work within that fictional world. I'm not crazy, it's Paula. It's not Ophelia, but how can what I know of her, and she know of me, and this technique bring out something which then can be put together to make the drama? It's the same like in painting. A painter is, doesn't think that what's being, you know, uh, Leonardo doesn't think that that is, is Mona Lisa. It's a painting of Mona Lisa. And he's working technically, I would think, on that painting. He also may have an emotional relationship with her. We don't know. But the point is, it's, it, the, the, the critique I make of some standard kinds of actor training is that you're supposed to bring the notion of the fourth wall into your rehearsal, that it's real. You're really the Prozorov household or you're really in Elsinore. I, I, for me, I, I reject that. You're not. You're in a room. You're in a rehearsal room. You're in a theater room, and you're making something. And that can be very, very powerful in terms of then making an interface that leads to a dramaturgy of narrative, but it allows the performer to go much, much further, because they're not bound by this pre-existing or even imagined character. Mm -hmm. Um, let's get uh, perhaps back to the book now that we uh, got uh, also a bit of what the boxes are and how to use them. Um, workshop theater is, is collaborative art. That's why we really, I think, also love theater. It's where humans have to talk to each other, make agreements, and we really listen to each other. So you also worked uh, in in with collaborators, also you three together. Tell us a little bit about the process of the book and how did you, when did the, the idea come up and the different stages? I had, I had written a proposal for Routledge, uh, and well, in the hopes of that Routledge would accept it. Ten years ago. It. Yeah, well, actually, it was, it was, was long, it was long 12 ago. years ago, because I remember. Yeah. And we then we Montreal. met about it. We went to Montreal to have all the, all the Rasa Boxes teachers come to do a sort of a, a sharing. Mm -hmm. And that's where, remember, we met with Ula in the living room, and we decided to do the book and sort of submit. I wasn't there. No, you weren't. You weren't not invited. It wasn't like you're not not invited. Is it? <laughs> no, we talked to Richard on Skype. Remember, yeah, we, we did. sat we in the you living in. room and we talked. Yeah, we did. Well, well, and then it took some time to, you know, we developed the proposal. Routledge accepted it. Of course, we thought we would do it much faster yeah. than we did. You and thought right away to do it in three. Oh, we wanted to include even more. Um, but it ended up being the three of us in yeah. the end yeah. to do the co-editing, co-authoring of the major pieces of it. 
But because this work has been taken up by Misha and so many other collaborators, we wanted to include as many voices and perspectives as we could within that. So we, yeah, we did the body of it. But I, I think one thing that took so long, well, first of all, we all have full-time jobs or, or moving and family. There's a lot, the pandemic, there was lots of things that real life. Um, but it's very hard to take a three-dimensional living, breathing, organism and translate it into a two-dimensional fixed document. So we had many conversations about, was the instruction this or was it this? And like, just like we, we would spend hours on like a word, like wordsmithing and like how was, because once it's fixed in the book, it's, it's, a, it's like this fixed thing and it's never been a fixed thing. So that's what I think took the longest. So thank you. Yeah. I think overcoming, yeah. you know, we had a lot to overcome and should we even do the book? You know, if once we put it in print, will people think that's kind of the gospel way to do it? Or will they see it as this kind of resource book for a living and breathing practice that has many years to go and to go on and just a, a touch point in time? And although I'm not an official editor of the book, I did read a lot of it in manuscript and make some suggestions yeah. editorially because I do with TDR, do a lot of editing. And it, there's an enormous amount of love and work that these three women and their collaborators put into this uh, book. And I personally appreciate it. The world should appreciate it. It's a very good effort. In, in a way, it's even so there are several chapters, two parts. One is kind of a theoretical, uh, I know, but from the view, and the other one is really the part where you explain, you know, what it's about and how do you do it. So tell us a bit about structure. the structure. Yeah. So the first part of the book is the theoretical and historical background. So it begins with a little bit of biography of Richard and sort of some of the various threads that fed into what eventually emerged as the training that he did with um, the performance group starting in the 60s um, and then later with East Coast artists and what eventually became the workshop that we participated in and then started teaching. At NYU, there's a, there's a beautiful chapter on Rasa by Shanti Pillai, who also came out of performance studies um, and had a background as uh, training in Bharatanatyam dance. And um, then there's Richard revised uh, quite significantly, actually, the Rasa aesthetics essay, which initially appeared in TDR in 2001, I want to say. And then the, then the middle section, as I think we've mentioned, is, is the biggest section of the book, and it is really... I think in, in my mind, it ended up being like a lot more, it, we, we ended up putting almost everything in there from the workshop. There's not a lot left out of it in terms of the major, um, the main exercises that, that we consider to be the core, the fundamental exercises um, of the work. It's all in there. It's in there in detail. We're trying to track like, what are the principles that move through this work so people can understand it. And also so that people who've already done the work have a reference to go to later and bring to their work or to their teaching of it. And then the final section in which Nisha, Nisha's essay appears with two other um, essays by drama therapists who've used the work in different ways is applications. So we have um, clown, directing, teaching undergraduate actors, drama therapy, K through 12 um, teachers, like training, teaching K through 12 teachers the work so they can use it in classrooms. Um, telenovela acting in Brazil. Um, it's a wide spectrum and it, it, there are so many applications that have not even been imagined yet. Like it's just the beginning, I think. The other thing about the middle section is uh, we offer exercise, but then we have an experience section where we take the reader through what that experience might be like. Not to say that is the experience you must have, but it, it offers sort of a, I'm standing at the line, I'm breathing, I have, you know, just sort of what that experience is like. And we also didn't put it in the order of the workshop. We clustered exercises. So all the crossing exercises all are together, the yoga, the different things. And then in the back, we have a thing that says, you know, this is, you might do A, B, C. Like, so we're clustering the exercises, but then we have sort of a three week workshop. So you can see how they'd be laid out, how, how you might, how, how you yeah. might actually do them in real mm -hmm. time. The book resisted, we, we thought it would be 
This is how we start the workshop and every exercise that's cumulative. We thought we would tell the story that way. It was a big mess. Uh, <laughs> in the end, you know, it was incomprehensible. So we found we had to cluster the exercises so people could see individual small progressions of things and then illustrate, well, this is day one's exercises, day two's, and they can go back and figure out how you might construct it. I find it fascinating that on one hand, it's a highly uh, intellectual abstract uh, a beautiful examination of theater. On the other hand, it talks about gut, the inside, thinking with your body. Try, the, your, but we, maybe, you know, at least in the article also, Richard says here, maybe we think very different than we do. And maybe Raza also is able to, to connect yeah. those. Is that the idea? Well, one of the uh, basic theories, Michael Gershon wrote a book called The Second Brain, <clears throat> which is about the enteric nervous system. In a word, 40% uh, of the uh, body's nerve cells are in your gut, 60% are in your head, and the vagus nerve connects the gut to the head, literally. And so when you say, I have a gut feeling, you're s talking about something true. Uh, although you can't articulate it, it doesn't go to the forebrain where I'm talking from and thinking from, but it goes to the base of the brain, the uh, quote reptilian brain, the, the, the movement part of the brain and the emotional, the amygdala, the emotional part of the brain, so that it's connected by the vagus nerve. And then Asian martial arts especially talk about the nablus is in one place, the place between the pubic bone and the navel, the lower gut, where they say is a, a seat of, of feeling and emotions. And I take those things literally. So when I read and I met Gershon and, and I read about this, you know, physiological confirmation of this ancient knowledge, let's put it that way. It, it really made a lot of sense. And so we're training that, but you can't train the vagus nerve in the same way that you learn Spanish. I mean, it can't come from the top down. It has to come from the bottom up. So this is a really bottom up uh, exercise. That's why when I gave the little demonstration of anger and so on, it's the bottom up. It's like, it's like very uh, primitive in the good sense. The word primitive is connected to the word prime, you know, like a prime number, the first thing, et cetera. So it's, it, 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 it comes up and it stimulates the way, and at the same time, I think it's physiologically sound. I think it's biologically sound. Yeah, so the your gut, in a way, gets as trained as the brain with the book, but also um, in Rasa. Um, my last question, let me also come um, to, to, to audience question. Um, Brittany wrote about Brecht. He was interested in the space between the performer and the performance. Um, that Stanislavski said we don't uh, 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 reproduce emotions. We have the memory of emotion. In Rasa, what, if you could put it into words, emotion or feeling, what is the new? What is the difference? What is, what did you find that is different, really different, radically different from those theories? You know, I'm having a memory of being in the Karuna box for the first time when I was training with Richard. And I, you know, was trying to, con it, what did we do is we try to connect sensation, breath, voice, more than feeling. The feeling is kind of later. And this enactment and, and turning on the nervous system's capabilities without turning on the deepest part of the emotion so that the actor is still there. And I had this memory, right? I, or I had this motion where I turned up my forearms and then I had the flash of a memory of helplessness in a very, very particular context. Now, another kind of technique may ask you to go further into that memory, to really delve in there, to get in there, but not this. I let it go, and I just worked with what that sensation brought me, and realizing that I can work with that sensation and whatever I was sensing here could go somewhere else, and I could move uh, a hook or a really powerful sensation that I had to work within the Karuna Rasa box, anywhere from any part of me, in any part of the room, in any context. And it wasn't reliant on memory, if that helps. Yeah, for me, it just doesn't replace Stanislavski. It doesn't replace anything. It, it works very well in tandem with. Um, for example, I directed a show at ASU, um, House of Spirits. And there's an exercise in the book, one of my favorite psychophysical exercises ever. Um, is called slow motion transformation, where it takes about two, three hours to cross the space in slow motion, and you move through the rasas, you have a score that you follow, um, and 
I had it, I had all the actors in the play played their character in, in the play. So they came dressed as that character. I didn't. They each planned their path. I didn't choreograph this, but at one point that was the Karuna box, which means sadness. And in the play, the um, mother is raped, and the son is the product of that rape. But in the play, they never are in the same scene together. But what happens is the son, sort of does this historical distancing, watches his mother through time and his memory get raped, right? There's this moment, very powerful moment in the play. But in the slow motion exercise, exercise they both found themselves in the Karuna box and they began to hug and cry and they, they form, formed this emotional bond in, as son and, and mother that was so powerful that then later when I staged it, very Brechtian and sort of emotionally distant, there was such this, they had created the memory of that relationship that then was able to move onto the stage. And I feel like if I had, if they had not experienced that relationship there, no matter how much I staged it, that would have just felt, it wouldn't have had that same level of depth. So I just feel like it's such an amazing tool for opening the actor to the richness of rasa and flavor and it's yeah, just a Michelle. great tool. Michelle, uh, Michelle, uh, like Michelle maybe. Okay. Um, I think for me, it's the presence of the audience. I think I learned in rasa boxes how to love being watched and how to, um, like, it was always like, oh God, I'm not really feeling, as an actor, I'm not really feeling this feeling. I can't really, you know, this constant insecurity around, um, was I really feeling it, blah, blah, blah. And then in the Rasa boxes, over time, I learned to appreciate that sense of, when I go into the box, I'm not as worried about myself because I wanna be sure that you are experiencing this gesture, right? <laughs> I want to, my sadness is not my sadness. My, it's, it's something that I'm opening myself to share with whoever is watching who or, or whoever is inside with me. So it kind of like made the whole thing feel more permeable, more generous, more, um, and, and celebrating and having the freedom and, and to let go of having to feel it, to be like, you know what? If I can evoke this feeling in you because I'm connecting with a sensation in myself, that's enough. And maybe that's everything, right? That, that, that whatever the, the story is, is not what's important. Well, you know, you were asked about Stanis Fazio and Brecht. So Brecht works from his theory of gestures uh, which is the significant gesture and the Frenzen effect, this kind of distance in between him, the performer and the performance. And Brecht, I think, always takes a dramaturgical point of view. He's a playwright, after all, who's directing his own play. So he has that interest. So, so let's say his interest is, quote, social, because he's trying to make these communications. Stanislavski is an actor, he's also a director, but he's a director from an actor's point of view. So to me, his core contribution is the two things, the through line of action, in other words, the objective, that there's something that each character wants in a, in a, in a drama, and the actor's job is to enact that in some way, the, the, the through line, and the method of physical action, how can you, which is later than his effective memory. The effective memory stuff is, Earlier in his career, method of physical action is from later after his encounter with his own student Meyerholtz, et cetera, et cetera. It's a whole business of theater history. But uh, Rasa Box is, is uh, my interest is as a performance theorist and director. I've never been an actor. I mean, I've gone on stage. I've been forced into it occasionally. But <laughs> I, I, I'm not, it's not something I, I really know uh, viscerally. And... Uh, I'm a playwright only, playwright monte. So, uh, mm -hmm. in other words, by accident, but interesting. But at any rate, so Rasa Boxes is about exactly what these three women have been talking. It's about the process of a certain kind of self knowledge. That's why it's so important for uh, therapy. And that self knowledge being a psychophysical self knowledge, not just a historical affective memory self-knowledge. It's a, it's, a, it's a visceral self-knowledge, if you will. 
and that self-knowledge then can be put in the service of any number of other techniques. You can have a visceral through line of action. You can have a visceral guest group and so on. So it's, in a certain sense, Rasa boxes to me is more uh, primitive or basic. It can be used by these other techniques which are, uh, 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 you know, I, I think at a, at, a, at a higher level of development. Uh, I'm not saying that necessarily better. Higher level, more, uh, less primitive. And, and, and primitive in my sense is very good. So Rasa boxes can be used by a Brechtian actor, by a Stanislavski actor, by a Meyer Holzen uh, biomechanical actor. It's, it's a, and therefore it can be used in therapy, it can be used in business, it can be used in, in any uh, doctors, it can be used in any, uh, in any station in life. It is, it is, it is of course a, a theater thing, that's where, but it's not limited to that and it's not fundamentally a theater thing. It's fundamentally something that can be used in theater as well as a lot of other places. And um, in, interestingly enough, the workshop today was one after many years in New York, but it's going to Brazil, it's going to uh, China. Tell us a little bit of the international context of the work. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, so I just got back from China in um, January. I was invited to work with 15 actors who were professional actors from around China, and we did a seven-day workshop. Um, and I didn't know what to expect. These are people who had no previous experience with the workshop, we were invited by Han Bin, who was going to be doing, who is going to be doing a version of Macbeth, uh, Richard Schreck, Richard's version from 1969? 59, 59, 59, yeah. Um, and so he wanted to bring me in, well, we were, we were talking with him, uh, to train the actors in Rasa boxes. Um, I was blown away. A lot of the actors were Peking opera trained, various forms of opera, and they just took to this work with such passion. I worked with Li Ning, who is uh, one of the top physical theater actors in China. He, he ran the morning physical training workshop and then we did the Rasa boxes in the afternoon. Um, and it was just really incredible uh, to see how they connected to the work. Um, and then we had one demonstration which was fantastic where they, one, um, they took the, you know, because in, like in, um, like in um, Bratnatyam in various forms, like, you know, sadness has a specific gesture, there's a specific movement. So one of the performers went through and showed us in her form how she moved in Karuna and in Raudra, and it was just a beautiful exchange um, back and forth. So I'm going to be go going back there maybe or through Zoom in about a year, but... Um, yeah, I introduced the work in Brazil in 2003 and just recently came back from their the first um, international seminar. I was the inter in the inter international in this first one, but um, it was people from all over Brazil um, who had been either trained by me or trained by people who were trained by me. And so there's just been this incredible um, rippling out of the work um, in multiple generations. There are m numerous... Um, master's theses written about the work. Um, it's just really taken off there tremendously, and I'm excited um, to see where it's going to go from here. And there are two of the contributor essays in the final section of the book are by Brazilian authors who are applying it in different ways. So yeah, it has. A, I, w I say to them all the time, I think there may be more shh, there may be more practitioners in Brazil than there are in the United States actually at this point. <laughs> but there's a lot of them. Yeah, and in drama therapy, what do we see in national, international connections? The um, the essay references work in Nürtingen in Germany and in uh, Beijing in China, a few few different places where I've been able to demonstrate Raza boxes and, and look at adaptations in a clinical context. And definitely there are other colleagues who've done this uh, internationally as well. There's, um, I mean, it translates, it translates. Yeah. Uh, one new arena that I've started to work in is working with uh, medical doctors, training first-year med students. So I've taught five classes now. Now I'm coming back to teach in the fall, working with first-year med students to train their, it's nothing to do with performance. It's, uh, we just work with breath, with sound, with movement, and doing scenarios, like you mentioned earlier, where you have to give someone terrible news, you have terminal cancer, uh, and they come up with their own scenarios, um, and it's become really valuable. It's actually, they're talking about making it one of their core required classes for their, it's called SCI, which is um, Medical Humanities. And it's, so it's been really successful in terms of that. I'd love to talk to you more about.
where that's going. So. But let's be talked enough, I think. Um, <laughs> um, thank you, by the way, everybody. But let's go and ask, yeah, there's some comments, questions. And maybe you introduce yourself. Um, <laughs> one, two, and then your name. And the first Hi, um, I'm Neusha. Um, so I have been doing this with Iranians, not not fully Rasa box, but um, some of the exercises with Iranians just to add to the um, <laughs> international palette of audiences for Rasa box. But my question is, have you experienced uh, powerful moments in the workshops that you have been leading that were extremely unexpected or extremely emotionally intense or powerful that um, you as instructors and leaders of the group were shocked by the power of this work and how did you manage that situation? Because this feels, I mean, I have done the work as a student, as a teacher, this is extremely powerful stuff and people can get to places that they didn't expect and that affects, affects the ensemble and the whole environment. And I want to know what, like, how, how do you handle that situation? I mean, I, I can't say that it was, um, I'm thinking about a moment in Remscheid, another place in Germany that, uh, where people were very, there were a couple of participants who were very moved. They were connecting to stories in their own lives. They wanted to take space to be able to reflect on what was emerging. And we can always return back to the work and the capacity to be able to step in and out of the spaces that somebody is moved, uh, is being moved by. But in this context or in that particular story, we just paused, just paused, took a breath and stayed with what was rising up and reflected on you know, the work, but also reflected on the people and what was happening in the room before we went back in. I can add to that. Um, so this work is very transformational. Um, the one number one thing that I experience for, from students who do it for the first time is more. I want more of this. So that that's generally uh, the feedback. But I'll say in my early days at ASU, um, I had an MFA class do the work, and we were all just going about, you know, doing the work. And I noticed one student in Karuna crying more than the others, where real tears, puddles of tears on the floor, um, sort of hyperventilating. Um, and I was noticing that. Uh, and then she ended up just kind of storming out of the room. And so I obviously I went and followed her. I learned later um, her father had just committed suicide. And that was a huge learning moment for me because, you know, we're dabbling, we're jumping in and out. But th that's the moment where I added the instruction. I will never tell you to go into a rasa that you do not want to go into. Um, that I will never say jump into Karuna, jump into that. Like you need to know, like, so that may not have been safe for her to do Karuna because it was just too raw for her. Or maybe you just got into a big argument with someone. Maybe Raudra is not a place where you, but notice that. Like, you know what? My grandmother just died. I just, I don't want to be there right now. And that's okay. But she came back into the work, but that really just unleashed the floodgates for that person. But I add that caution now. One of my instructions to people is, uh, not all the time, but sometimes, have an impulse and do not follow it. You will all recognize this. Just let it go through you. What's, this, what's the impulse underneath that impulse? What's the one underneath that? So that you get to learn to, in a certain sense, rehearse or play with your feelings rather than going with it. It's kind of like Heraclitus's river, but don't put your foot in it. But see it go by and see what's next. Uh, the second thing is that because of the line, of crossing lines, you're in a, a world of play. Ritual and play are very important to me, and they two converge. It's not the time to get into the deep theory of it. But if you're in a world of play, everything happens and nothing happens. And even though the experience, like that horrible experience you're saying of the suicide, uh, in the world of the of play, the suicide is actual, but your grief is of something else again, and that 
I would try to help that person see a little bit of daylight between the horror of the event and the quote playing with, not to disrespect because I respect play greatly, the playing with your grief. The suicide is an event. The grief is a second event triggered by the first event, but not the same as the first event. This gets back to Brecht again. So how do you get a, a Fremsman effect between that? Now, I wouldn't do it so dryly to somebody, obviously, but my job as an instructor is to allow that to play out. Had the person run away in my workshop, I probably would have said to everyone, stay here, I'm going there, uh, I need to know what's going on and how to help. And I would try to bring the person back because I'm not responsible for the suicide, but I am somewhat responsible for the expression of the grief. So it's the expression of the grief that I have to work with in a certain way and to liberate from because Rasa boxes finally has to be in the dimension of the imagination, in the dimension of play, not, not in the dimension of actuality, actuality. It's a different actuality. I mean, they're all real, but it's different if you can see it and you can learn that. And I think that's a very good thing to learn. It also depends what you're talking about by intensity. There's an in intensity of experience and then there's like complete dysregulation, destabilization. These are different things and need, I think, to be treated differently. I think all of us as facilitators need to have tools at the ready for helping to regulate the nervous system, for helping to bring people back as it were, because sometimes stepping out of the, across the line is not enough. Um, and I would, you know, ask for <laughs> your input on that as well in, in working in a therapeutic context. But we are kind of walking a line that absolutely it's play, it's creative, but it also can touch very deeply. Um, right now, I think we do need to be touched very deeply in real ways in terms of how this work connects to real wor world things that are happening, um, which is at one of the directions I'm going in in my work now. So, um, and these questions of, and how do we hold that? oh, and we're also holding this. Okay, that's even more, right? How do we hold these big things that are connected often to traumatic um, individual experiences and traumatic shared experiences? Yeah. Hi, my name is Galway McCullough, and uh, the idea of an emotional athlete. I come to uh, performance from athletics and stage combat, fight choreography, all of this. Thing that's my bouncing around my brain is something very early in my life as an actor, a, what I call a refractory period of a character staying with me. My dad came to see a show my freshman year of college and was like, ah, I get it now. Because like, I guess for the last month, that character had been coming, showing up even just in the phone calls I was having with my father. And I remember the first show that I had, which was actually a really incredibly heavy show, um, that I got to a place where I'm backstage chatting, reading a book. Oh, cue, got to go. And totally in character and then out of. And had, as soon as the curtain went up, as soon as the show was done, I didn't have Lieutenant Boxler with me anymore. You know, and that was a great character to not have following me around. So I'm interested to see how you think in terms of, oh, okay, I'm a method actor. I've got to be in character and have everyone call me President Lincoln, the entire rehearsal in performance and, you know, and, and all of that. So we have people who are performers that think that is the only way to perform a role, which I don't want to go there, you know, and I don't think that's a really healthy way of approaching our craft. So this idea of, you know, when you were talking about, oh, whistle, oh, da, 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 da. we're back in. Uh, how does this refractory period and in and out of character and, and being fully invested, I'm just curious to hear some conversation about that. Well, if, if I were to, you know, 
if a, if a deep method, uh, Marlon Brando work, walked into one of our uh, workshops, you know, I would ha say, Marlon, why are you here? So, I mean, if I knew who he was and what he wanted to do, so that it's, it's like, I'm assuming that if you walk into the actor's studio, you're interested in learning somewhat what Strasberg and his followers do. If you walk into a Rosselbox's place, you're interested in that. I mean, you, you made your choice. It's not, it may be different in therapy and in prisons where incarcerated people, but in terms of the free participation. So uh, with a dyed in the wool method actor, I would say, well, here's something else you can add. And part of your method uh, could be the uh, experience of being in Rosselbox's for three weeks. Or, or whatever, in other words, because it's a voluntary operation. I mean, I don't see that there would be a problem because a person is not going to stumble on this method any more than a person would stumble on the actor's studio. You would kind of know some of its presumptions, or, or after the first workshop, you would know and you would say, this is not for me, and you would leave. But if it is for you, then you, you're, you want to add to your repertory. I mean, a, a, Great, a method actor can learn this technique. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, diseased about a method actor. There, there are great method actors, and they can learn this as well. And, and the other side, are, too, a Rasa Box's trained person could learn the Strasberg method and, uh, and benefit for it. I mean, I don't see the problem, actually. Um, I think the notion of de-rolling is absolutely essential for the mental health of the actor. Um, you hear so many stories, and it, one I heard more recently was when Joaquin Phoenix uh, played the Joker, which was a very dark, dark character. It took him six months to even be able to relate, uh, like to come back to himself, so to speak. And I think that's dangerous. Um, and I, I, I think that these offer tools, uh, whether you combine the tools or however, but it offers a concrete tool to come out of that. Um, you've just played Blanche Dubois, you've just played a character that's really heavy. Like, how do you come out of that? It's not healthy to play that over and over every night. Um, we are talking about mental health, we're talking about boundaries. For me, at the end of every class that I teach, we, we end in Shanta and we do an exercise called Shanta Waterfall where I imagine after you've stirred up all of these emotional like breath and Imagine you're under a waterfall and like watercolor, just let it wash off of you. Like almost like scrub it away. Come back to that place of balance. And Paul Ekman, one of my favorite things he says is we're not always in the grips of an emotion because if we were, it would be very intense. Emotions are, they have a beginning, middle and end and they're very intense and we're not always in the grips of them. Um, and so I think it's important to wash off the rasas in like a watercolor afterwards and come back to Shanta, come back to that place of balance. And I tell this to my young actors, I said, Shanta is always available to you. If you're feeling stressed out in your life, you're having an exam, make a little Shanta box and just before your exam and just get into it. You know, like I'm, I'm sort of trying to use this as a way to just regulate their nervous systems as young people in the world. And they are really responding to that. I'll just say I've shared the same kind of exercise with uh, with mental health providers. Where's your Shanta box? And they absolutely draw on that resource. Shanta is that ninth one. Maybe one more? Was it? Yeah. Hi, I'm David Zinder. I've known Richard for many, many years. Um, I work with the Chekhov Technique. And uh, I, there's one specific thing that uh, I think you mentioned, which I'm very curious about because it's something that comes up in the, among the Chekhov technique practitioners a lot. We work a lot with archetypes, not, nothing so, quite so primitive as the Raza boxes. But like you said, a little bit more sophisticated. But there is always an issue of cliches. And you, I think you mentioned it, Richard, and this is something that I'd be very interested to hear, how you deal with it. Uh, I, I must admit, Richard came. To, I brought Richard to Israel. He gave us a workshop on the Rasa boxes. I did not follow it afterwards. Um, that's one of the reasons I came today. Apart from the fact that I'm in New York, uh, 
but yeah. he, he had a book launch, his own little book. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm directing. So I'm curious about this concept of cliche because we, we struggle with it a lot because the archetypes are a very powerful part of the Chekhov technique. Well, for me, you know, it's like, like these uh, cliches or stereotypes or whatever. They have a bad name. I like them, and I think it's a good place to start with because everybody knows them. And, uh, and, and what's really powerful about a cliche is that your cliche for Hasya and his cliche for Hasya would be different. Even though you're both thinking you're doing like, I just did a laughter thing, it would be different. So uh, I like to start there because it's kind of very close. I love popular culture. It's very close to the popular imagination. But from there, you can go other places. But, but that's a good place to start because it doesn't baffle people. Uh, and you, the first time through these things, do the most cliche, do, do the most cliche. It'll lead you from one place to another. So it's not something like, oh, that's horrible, that's a cliche. No, that's where you start. And, and, and I've never, it's never failed in any workshop I've ever led that people stay there. They find something else that's very particular to them. At the same time, they maintain some of the truth of that cl cliche. I'm fond of saying that one of Shakespeare's greatest lines has only one syllable words and one word that has two syllables. To be or not to be, that is the question. The only word in that whole sentence that has two syllables is question. And what a great line. So what could be more cliche than to be or not to be? That is the. And then question, you get very complex. So uh, I, I find archetype, cliche, stereotype very closely related. You start there and you get to the particulars. But you never lose the tree and the root. And the root. Uh, again, with Jung and things, I think archetype, stereotype, cliche, they're all down there on, on the roots. And, and, and I, I don't like to avoid them. I like to start with them. You know, add to that. And I train actors, I guess. And, you know, you see the, early, the, the cliches are also just to learn the alphabet of the wrestling. But you get sick of yourself after a while. You go in the box, you start doing the same thing. <laughs> You know, all right, I'm comfortable now. I can do it. Now what else? And then we have, you know, then that brings the actor themselves, guided by themselves, guided by their own questions, guided by their own will and desire, to say what else? And then we say, well, let's let's enter in this way, or let's put something on the wall. Let's put let's, that impulse aside. Yeah, you know, you and you and you and you you blindfold. You know, there are so many ways to start to have new experiences until the actor has worn through those cliches, sort of getting to the other side. You let, you let the actor have the cliches to learn. And they will eventually get sick of themselves enough to break through to something else, if, if the practice is allowed to go to those depths. And oftentimes, you know, we're at uh, an introductory level. So it's, that's the via negativa. I, I talked about it this afternoon, the workshop. The, sometimes the job of the leader is to take something away. You can't use your hands. Uh, you can't use that sound. You know what? What happens if you take something away, but you still have to enact something? The via negativa, and and uh, and subtraction rather than addition. I think sometimes too often in training we want to add things when what we should be doing is taking things away. And if we take things away, the performer, the person, will find things, resources in themselves that you can't give to them. You can't suggest to them. I don't know everything that's in her or in you or in you, but if I could take away your cliche, I could take away the first gesture and just simply say, I don't know what it is, but don't do that. Uh, you'll find things. Also, um, one of my favorite aspects of the workshop is that there are the larger workshop that includes Rasa boxes, but has many other things leading up to it. There's a, a series of exercises in which we follow no leader in which what is taken away is your ability to initiate anything. So what happens in this context is really amazing because it's a group creativity that just, it's completely emergent. So that's a space in which I don't have to invent what's new. What's new is gonna happen because I'm connected to what I'm doing with these other people. And it's something happening between us and emerging, you know, 
out of that. So, so that's one of the ways I think this work builds a foundation in that makes possible things that we would never invent as individuals ourselves, but that come out of the shared energy and movement. For me, the intensity exercise, we do an intensity arc from moving from one to 100, which is sort of intensity levels. For me, that's where the cliches really start to break down, because we ask people to start at the 90%. Oh, like we don't experience, you know, fear like that every time, right? Uh, but when we start to work with these intensities, maybe two percent is just the eyes, like more filmic acting, and then we work with eighty percent on the inside, but only ten percent on the outside. So we start to work with interior and exterior intensities, and for me, that's where the work starts to get interesting, and the actors start saying, "Oh, wow, okay, that feels more authentic." I don't like that word, but more recognizable as an emotion. Like, they're like, I don't feel that. And these are the basics, but it eventually gets to mixing and layering, right? And, right. and, and these rustles are fleeting. They come in and they come out. So you don't just stick with one thing. You learn that so you can consciously decide and, and work with and have the flavor of even an improvisation where you can go next and, and the mixed experience that life is. Yeah, so um, I think that's a, that's a good quote to end the experience of life. And um, so really thank you for giving us a view into the um, Radha universe. And, um, and um, thank you all for coming out. Thanks to our viewers um, from HowlRound. And um, thank you, Richard, and uh, great testimony to your work next to many others, what you did. And also to the three of you to take an idea and put it into a new form in a book and it will go out. Um, from here, so um, it's a great Raja Kabbalah, I think, you know, it's really un unlimited, uh, unlimited, you know, it's a, and, um, and so you can go as deep as you want, but also rest on the surface, and it's an invitation to engage in life, so what art is self, and that if anything is worth to spend time with in life, it's art, we all know that, it's the most interesting, the most rewarding, and this is a fantastic uh, entryway to go in, so thank you for coming. Thank you, Frank, for having us. Thank you. And if anyone is interested in experiencing the work, please make sure you put yourself on our mailing list. We have a QR code up outside. Um, and you'll hear about workshops that are going to be happening here in New York. We have one this weekend in Philadelphia, if anyone happens to be in that area. And, and our website will list upcoming workshops. Yes. Thank you so much for coming.